Welcome to another episode of Mistake Free Real Estate Podcast. I am your host, Mark Delator, and I'm excited today to be joined by a former investor of ours, a very special guest, Alistair Beard. Alistair, welcome to the show, mate. Hey, Mark. Thank you very much for having me. Great to be here. Guys, Alistair Beard has uh, woken up very early this morning uh, to join us all the way from Melbourne, Australia. Alistair's a CFO consultant for companies in Australia, and he was the principal that I was dealing with uh, when an Australian investment fund was created and chose to invest in the American housing market kind of post GFC collapse around 2013 and 14. So I thought it would be fun to kind of take a trip down memory lane with Alistair and talk about the decisions that it took to be able to invest from afar. A lot of our investor clients, Alistair, are debating whether to invest in Kansas City from even just, you know, whether it's Australia, New Zealand, the UK or Hong Kong, Brazil, uh, Germany. We have investors from all over the world, as well as obviously in all states of America. And so I wanted to be able to share with people the due diligence because you guys not only invested from afar, but it wasn't just your decision. You had to uh, get a fund and a syndicate effectively of guys to come do that. So uh, thanks for your time today. And, uh, you know, I want to start by saying, you know, what we saw back at that time period was an epic meltdown in the U.S. housing market. Uh, your team jumped on an opportunity to not only capitalize on the weak U.S. dollar, but also the weak U.S. housing market. Take us back to that time, Alistair. What was it like for you and your team sitting in Melbourne and looking at America during that time period? Thanks, Mark. Uh, yeah, look, we were here and you've got GFC and there's sort of uh, blood on the floor everywhere all across the world. And a lot of the impacts of that seem to have really hit America hard. Now, I know, you know, all the subprime crisis uh, you know, originated in America and a lot of the damage, you know, the, the, the asset damage was, was there, but the implications were all over the world. The ripple effects went everywhere. So, um, you know, the Australian market was, was, uh, was quite badly affected and confidence everywhere as a result of uh, uh, the GFC and the subprime meltdown. But we were sitting in Melbourne, Australia, that's where I'm at now, thinking... You know, geez, the, the, the uh, America's come off, you know, a massive amount. You know, surely the country is, is stronger than that. And, you know, a lot of people were saying, oh, America's gone. You know, like it, it's, it's, it's totaled, it's, it's ruined forever as a result of this. It's never coming back. You know, it'll be, it'll be somewhere else in the future. And we thought, well, that's really, uh, and that's what a lot of people genuinely thought. Um, and, you know, doomsayers, it's easy to say, oh, look, it's gone forever. Um, we thought, well, no, we don't believe that. You know, America's a big, strongest economy in the world. Uh, it's had a huge correction, uh, but we see it recovering and we see it recovering quite well. And not only that, but we saw, uh, you know, the correction that had taken place was, was you know, an overcorrection. And that's what, what invariably what happens, you know. So we thought, look, we... Uh, as a group, and uh, with Joff McLeod, Brad Reed, Phil Fagley, group of accountants that I work for, all said, we think this is a great investment opportunity. And uh, let's see if we can take advantage of it. How we go and do that, I don't know. Uh, so anyway, we all put our heads together and thought, well, look, it's, it makes sense. Let's all go and have a play and see if we can get others to invest with us. So we went around... Um, spoke to a number of people. There was a number of uh, others in Australia were starting to do it. A number of people said, don't do that. That's a terrible idea. Uh, we spoke to three or four operators here. Uh, then we started speaking to people in America uh, and thinking how we structure this play and how best to do it. And, you know, there were people, oh, everyone, you know, everyone wants brownstones in New York. You know, there were people looking at that. And we thought, well, look, we're investing from the other side of the world. Um, actually, 14,927 kilometres away, <laughs> which was the, right. uh, the name of the company we ended up establishing, which is, I don't know what, uh, uh, 900,000 miles away. Um, you know, it, it's, it's a long way away. It, it's, it's, it's all a bit of sort of unknown. We, we believe in the macroeconomics of the whole thing. But, um, 
you know, there's a deployment risk that's uh, uh, attached to this and none of us are, uh, you know, experts in, you know, we had a lot of real estate uh, expertise, but none of us, none of us are there on the ground uh, and experts in the uh, US residential property market. So over time with the due diligence that we undertook as how best to do this, we came in through, through other relationships and connections to, to yourself, Mark, at SBD. And it became very clear to us that one, you know, you're a good guy with a good business, but someone who, who had a model that we liked and a, a relationship with, that we could establish, someone who uh, we could trust and also had good bona fides. There were other connections through um, parents and sort of mutual clients through the, through the fund. Uh, so you weren't a complete unknown, but it was a good fit. And not only that, but we had somebody who was in operation with a real business on the ground in KC. And that's why we ended up uh, going with SBD in the KC market, because we were having a punt on America. So where it was in America really didn't matter. I mean, ultimately, you know, KC and Missouri was important because of uh, the legislation that's uh, there, along with a few other states. But it was really the SBD team uh, that we liked and gave us comfort that if we were going to do this, our investment was then going to be in good hands and well managed for the duration of the, the investment window. And that's what we were saying five years. So when you were in that room, I mean, obviously, um, what was Australia like at the time? I mean, you guys uh, were impacted, like you said, the opportunities, I know it was an, a, an escape for you to, to take that dive on America, throw some money over there. The US dollar had also collapsed effectively, correct? So you guys, it was almost a double. It ended up obviously in your favor in hindsight. I think you would say you exited at a timely manner, currency wise, perhaps a little too early, um, you know, on the back end as far as the sale. But you, like you say, you're in a five year time period and you had to honor that for your investors. What was it like in Australia at the time? I, you know, it, it baffles me that when you were trying to crowd fundraise, there were still people that were saying, you know, no, I mean, it goes, it takes me back to the mindset of Warren Buffett saying, you know, when those are fearful, be greedy. And when those people are being greedy, be fearful. I think right now there are people out there being, being greedy. And um, back in 2013, people were super fearful. And I think that was the time to really gobble up as much real estate as you possibly could. Does it look, do you look back and think it was a strange occurrence for people to be turning their nose up at, at this opportunity or is that just human nature that there's always those naysayers oh human nature and uh, everyone likes to get on board an idea once it's become um uh what's the word not proven not commonplace what's that proven yeah, yeah proven or you know uh, so-and-so else is into it and these people are into it. Now I'm happy to talk like the expert. When it's uh, uh, people are very uncomfortable getting behind an idea, uh, uh, you know, a lot, unless, you know, all their friends are already onto it and there's a certain FOMO aspect. Being a first mover is difficult for a lot of people. So that part of human nature um, is Have you a, is always been an early adopter? Have you always been an early adopter, Alistair? Was that easy for you to overcome that challenge? Are you just a black and white thinker? Or what made you get to the point mentally where you were able to bridge the gap and say, no, I think this is a wise investment? Because obviously you threw money in just like everybody else. What made you get to that point of being comfortable with it? Yeah, well, exactly. I, I thought it was actually a very wise investment. I didn't see it as as a, you know, an outlandish punt, which a lot of us, a lot of people that didn't invest as, as saw it. I thought all the, the market, the fundamental and fundamentals and the economic fundamentals were very strong. It just became a, uh, a question of, you know, that deployment and operational risk, how best to, to mitigate that. And look, we could have gone with any number of operators in, uh, in the US in any one number of locations. But in order to defray that risk, a uh, legislative market and operational, that's why we went with SBD. But um, uh, yeah, look, it's quite frustrating, I think, also, because you say, look, we're going to do all the work. We've got this great opportunity here. We're providing you uh, uh, this great investment opportunity, and it's all packaged up, ready for you. You don't have to do anything but uh, send us the check sort of thing. And people are very, oh, no, 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 no. Oh, somebody told me, 
you know, don't get into that or that's very risky or, oh, I don't know about that. People, you know, when there's fear, people focus on they'd rather buy, uh, you know, the house next door, uh, something closer to home uh, than lift their eyes. But I always think, well, you know, there's, everybody's looking at that, you know, the houses in their own block. Uh, it's it's more interesting, and I think it's 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 more valuable to lift your eyes and look at uh, bigger opportunities on a you know. Yeah, and I think also, and in, in, you know, just for total transparency, although you guys had a very successful fund, it was probably, you know, in fairness, about a third of how you know when you originally envisioned it, you thought this thing being a massive, you know, fifteen twenty million dollar fund, and it didn't quite get there. You you clearly would have bought more if you could have, correct? Oh, definitely. And that's, that's our one regret out of this is that I didn't push harder. And the biggest, um, uh, yeah, yeah the, I think the biggest limitation we had was a lack of sales. You know, I, I would tell people about the fundamentals of real estate and US residential real estate and working with SBD and how we'd, we'd addressed all the risks uh, from a, uh, a sensible, logical, rational perspective, but a lot of people don't invest that way, and that was a that was a mistake I made at the time. Was thinking that uh, investors are rational. Uh, a lot of them are not. In order to get uh, volume, you know, because after we um, uh, set these funds off, uh, you end up with operators like. Um, uh, Dixon Advisory, who partnered up with, with Evans and Partners, bought uh, you know multiple um, properties in uh, in New York and New Jersey, and from Australia, and then sent the idiot son over to New York to manage this portfolio, who was then um, <laughs> greasing the palm of Rudy Giuliani, and the whole thing. Um, you know, uh, blew up because there were ignorant people that didn't weren't weren't Americans living and breathing that real estate in that neighbourhood, uh, and the thing was then poorly managed, and investors have lost a lot of money on those uh, U.S. Masters uh, fund, and it's in court with the uh, government regulator now. But I suppose the, you know, the, the, the concept of US resident re real estate was the same, but they had a very glossy marketing uh, team and convinced people to invest on sweet brownstones in New York and you were going to make a fortune rather than strong fundamentals of real estate, which was what we were uh, proposing in KC. And... Uh, you know, they ended up raising a, a fortune and, you know, losing most of it. We were, we struggled to, to raise, you know, a couple of mil that we did. And, uh, but, you know, all our investors were thrilled and there was a great result at the end of it. Yeah, so, I think it's a classic person at the front of the room. You know, most sales, you know, when you have that guy selling the, the real estate investment software, you're not selling, hey, you can go and get a consistent 6 to 7% return on your money and, and plus the appreciation, up, appreciation upside and some hedge on the, on the inflation and, and you know, buying a sturdy asset. You're not talking logically. It's always, when do you want to retire? Do you want to be sailing on the yacht yeah. and you know, del delving into, you know, you're, you're hitting on, they're hitting on all the emotions because there are emotions. And I think that's why, unfortunately, you know, the, the sales aspect of, of buying into a program sometimes is so the, the syrup and, and, and uh, you know, the syrup and, and milk and honey where you're trying to picture yourself or have your investor picture themselves luxur luxuriously laying out on a beach with a Corona in their hand. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's a bad use of term in this current times. <laughs> uh, Modelo, perhaps. But once you have that vision, you're selling to that as opposed to just selling on the logic, which I think you from a you know, certainly kind of a, a CFO's logical stance. You're like, hey, we've checked all the boxes. Is this a logical way to go? Yeah, yeah, that's right. So that, look, that was, that was, um, I, I think the other thing is, you know, that's a, that's a, you know, a sales aspect, but that sort of thing happens all the time. You get all those people in the room together, you know, you give them a glass of champagne and then you say, oh, well, uh, Barry next door or Janet, you know, over there, she's investing this money. 
I can see the whites of her eyes. Do I want to miss out when she's taking advantage of the opportunity? She's going to be retired in, you know, five on the on the beach with the uh, corona, and uh, uh, you know, I'm not. Uh, and that sort of drives people that emotional aspect. But um, look, at the end of the day, I think it's it's. I think you just have the the strength of your convictions, and the next time you do it, uh, we just push that line harder, and then. Uh, get a uh, a large um, cornerstone investor, and that that's another way of doing it. Rather than having to have the glossy brochure and the uh, the investment uh, seminars uh, with the free champagne and the um, uh, pictures of the beach, um, you know, uh, do your work on a cornerstone investor, and often they'll bring you know others with them. Sure. Uh, So for our audience, I mean, primarily we're going to be talking about guys that are making the decision on their own about whether to invest or not. Let's talk forward about, you know, the logistics of the due diligence that you did, because you did it at a very high level. um, And and I want to understand the depths that you went to, um, because obviously you didn't just investigate Kansas City. There were several markets that you looked at. Um, and again, we're not, you know, I appreciate your kind words. This is not a, a definitely not a, a, an SBD um, advertisement, um, but really want to understand the due diligence you went through um, to understand, you know, thoughts on, you know, what drivers did you have? What were the absolute um, must haves when you were looking at investments from so far away? Yeah. And look, that's true. It's not just an SBD. I mean, we could well have latched upon another team in America that were able to offer the same level of comfort. Um, uh, We didn't, and we ended up very happy with SBD. But, um, you know, there's, there's, again, there's that emotional aspect. Everyone said, oh, US, oh, we're investing in US. Now, what are you investing for? Are you investing for make money? And this was cash investment. We couldn't have any debt attached to it. So, you know, it was very much uh, cash flow positive uh, a return and most people put their uh, super monies or um, what, what do you call it uh, 1099 um, self-managed super fund yep um, 401ks yeah yeah 401k sorry um, uh, and people go oh, Kansas City where's that like uh, Dorothy is that like you know <laughs> this is before uh, the Royals won the World Series of course right Elsa <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, speaking of which, um, is that Kansas? No, no, it's Missouri. Oh, where's that? Oh, what happens there? And it's like, well, you know, that's your ignorance. But then a lot of Americans will say the same thing, you know, that live on the coast. Yeah. They go, oh, oh, yeah, you fly over that place, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's like, well, it's a great place, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, the, the industry fundamentals are quite strong. There's a mix of industries. And the fact is we're investing to make money. And we have a partner on the ground that we can work well with who lives and breathes uh, real estate on the ground. And we're in the business of making money. So whether it's a, uh, you know, a house in Grandview or Raytown or it's, it's in uh, you know, downtown Manhattan, does it matter? Are you looking for a dinner table uh, conversation to tell your friends or are you looking to make money and, uh, you know, end up like, I mean, that's, uh, I think the ones that uh, had the brownstones in uh, New York had a great dinner table conversation for a while there. And now it's not so good. The, 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 our friends and investors that were part of our syndicate um, had that US property story, which ended up being very beneficial for them. But um uh, you know, and that's that's sort of separating the emotion, but it gets back to the due diligence. What we want to, we as as the trustees of this syndicate, were responsible for not losing people's money and delivering them a solid return as we promised. So it was a matter of how best can we do that uh, and not make a fool of ourselves and lose people's money because that's uh, the last thing we wanted to do. So we had some. Uh, risk mitigation of not only our own money that we put into this, but our own reputations. So, you know, it was important that we had a solution uh, that we were confident that we could execute and and deliver upon the promises 
uh, without having to actively manage this, uh, you know, week in, week out from the other side of the world, uh, 14, 927 kilometres away. How big a deal was the uh, currency risk to you at the time? Did you have to consider that in your investing strategy? Uh, yeah, well, look, I mean, at the time, the currency was, um, uh, you know, US currency was plummeting against the Aussie dollar. I think we ended up uh, investing the, in the second trust at a dollar five. Uh, so for every, um, uh, you know, one Aussie dollar, we get a dollar five US, uh, which is which is quite extreme. But people, you know, again, you've got to deal with the, oh, it's only going to get worse. But, you know, if you look at history and the relative strengths of the two economies, that wasn't going to last forever. Um, but we did want to make sure, you know, the most important, the, the currency is always a risk and we didn't re, uh, hedge against currency. But the biggest thing was really the assets and the ability for those assets to yield for us and uh, the ability to be confident someone was managing those uh, well on our behalf without us having to be, you know, there on the ground all the time doing the work ourselves. When you were in a unique position, which our investors typically are not, in that you had to develop, you, you were speculating in a sense because you did have a timeline and a horizon of five years. Most of our investors are just buying and holding and we coach now, obviously, that our investors are, you know, accumulators of quality real estate assets not flippers, right? So they didn't have a five-year time period trying to time the market like you did. So that's why your due diligence, due diligence was even more critical. And obviously you timed, you know, it's pretty safe to time the market when you see the market bottoming out. However, in this time period, it's just simply, you know, look, we can deliver a quality cash flowing asset that will stand the test of time. And um, so, you know, for perspective, you know, what our investors typically are, are questioning now is not so much what are we going to look at at a five-year time period is in 20 years time, is this asset going to be worth more? And typically it's going to double in value every 20 years. Obviously, as you've right. looked online, you know, the last 10 years, it's doubled in value in 10 years. But I think conservatively in 20, 25 years, these assets will double in value again. And the problem, and, the, and so then it comes down to, can you cash flow the assets throughout that time period? Talk a little bit about what your expectations would be if you're looking, you know, in, at a real estate investment in Australia, um, for comparison's sake, or something in the US. What is a reasonable return? Is a two or three percent return on your money something that would be acceptable in your eyes as a CFO of those of, of deploying assets? Uh, look now, yeah, look definitely. Uh, if if I can get uh, two, three, four percent. I'd say take it and bank it. And if that's supported, um, if, you know, there's under uh, there's two things. Um, I'll, just, I'll just get back to that um, return issue. The other thing I was going to say with the, with the real estate investing, our investors were passive. So there was some of the view of uh, people flipping homes. That's a very active investment strategy and involves a lot of work. Most of our, our investors, this was, as I said, the, their uh, 401k, uh, it was passive money. They wanted it working for them without them having to manage it. So we were managed, well, we were managing the fund and then you were managing the, uh, the investments. But it was a, was a passive strategy. So it, it suited the passive investor. Uh, uh, you know, people had other day jobs. To do so, you know, and I think that's an important distinction. Everyone says, "Oh, you know, you make a fortune flipping homes and whatever," but you know that that's almost a full-time job. You know, are you prepared to, um, uh, you know, sacrifice your day job? So there's there's those two things people need to bear in mind is whether they're an active or passive investor, um, and the other thing, getting onto your your uh, your question of return, is what's a what's a good return at the moment. You know, you, you get nothing in the bank for a term deposit here in Australia, which is pretty much the same the world over. And I think in uh, uh, several European countries, it's actually negative. You're, you're paying to leave your money in the bank. Um, so, you know, that becomes the question of, well, uh, you know, do you leave your money in the bank at a cost or, or no return? And I think, I think there's two risks to that. One 
there is some latent inflation in the world anyway at the moment. So I think you need to be getting some form of a return. Uh, and this, this without sort of ridiculously chasing yield. And the other thing is, I think, you know, uh, fiat currencies the world over are being uh, incredibly devalued. I mean, you have quantitative easing in America. We have the same thing going on here in Australia. In many fronts, they wrap it up and call it different names, but it's all the same thing. And, you know, it's going on in the EU uh, incredibly hard and in the uh, pound sterling. It's really going on all over the world. So you don't notice the impacts of it while everyone's doing it. But at some point, people are going to start winding back on the money printing Uh and then inflation, you know, as inflation is going to start to kick in, uh, you'll find the value of these uh, cash holdings is even further diminished. So uh, I'm not a good fan of, uh, you know, leaving too much money in cash holdings at the moment in, in fiat currencies. Um, you know, you can look at gold and Bitcoin and other, other stores of value. But I think hard assets... Um, is is the way to go uh something that's tangible that's always going to be a value and it's not definitely denominated in, in fear or well, uh, it has an inflation hedge against the devaluation devalu of these fiat currencies so um if you can get your money in a in a hard asset and it's giving you a yield i think if you're getting three or four or even five percent return that's a fantastic uh thing um and, you know, you should be very comfortable with that. You can, ch you can potentially chase higher yields in the stock market. But, you know, again, that's very speculative uh, to get that sort of, a, you know, much more than that at this stage. So I'd say, you know, hard assets. And again, you know, you might be all over it this month and all over it this year, but other things happen in your life next year and you, you, know, you uh, take your eye off it. With, with real estate investing, um, it doesn't matter if you take your eye off it for six months because, you know, the asset's not going anywhere. It's always going to be a value and you're always going to be able to get a tenant for it. I mean, there's probably some exceptions to that, but, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not, as, not as vulnerable to your everyday attention. No, so, it, no, as long as you have dialed in property management, right? Because they overcome the two big killers of cash flow, which are your vacancy and your maintenance. If you can control those two uh, through really good property managers, then you're correct. It can truly be a passive investment. Yeah. Well, that's right. That's if you if you pay. Yeah. That's why you pay a property manager to do that for you. Uh, uh, you know, some people try and do it themselves, and and good luck to them. I guess uh, that helps if the if the uh, properties are all in their neighbourhood, uh, and it's easier for them to manage, and they have time to do that and the expertise. Otherwise. You know, I'd say you pay a property manager to do that job for you and they're the uh, experts and they'll always do it well. And particularly the tenant risk, you know, you might say, oh, I can do rehabs as well as a property manager. But, uh, you know, I think the tenant risk is a strong one because that's one of your biggest exposures. So, uh, you know, a good property manager should be able to get you good tenants in good time. Did you see a bigger, I'm putting you on the spot here because I haven't asked you this question prior, but... Did you see a difference in the return on your, because you bought some, you diversified quite nicely in your portfolio where you had some smaller properties that were probably cash flowing a little bit better, but um, had lesser appreciation. And then you bought some higher end homes that were definitely in the A plus areas of town and Lee Summit and whatnot, where you probably gained some appreciation that you saw when you sold, but probably didn't cash flow as well through that time period. Did you feel looking back that your and analyzing your returns that there was one that you would have liked to do more of, or did you like a, the, the sampling of both to diversify your risk? Uh, no, look, I think I like both of them. I mean, you know, they all go up and down during time. I think that the, the key is to hang on. Uh, that was one of the regrets. Now, because we had a syndicate with, you know, a number of uh, different investors with different profiles, as I said, most of it was self-managed, uh, uh, you know, retirement savings. Um, we had promised five years and we wanted to deliver, you know, a healthy returns at the end of five years and do what we said we were going to do, not leave people hanging. Um, 
But I think, you know, in, in that fund, the group, the mix of um, uh, the lower value or lower priced homes with a slightly higher return, um, it was good. They sort of uh, offset each other. So if you can afford to, but it's, it, you know, it becomes a price point too. You know, but, uh, sometimes, you know, not everyone can afford uh, the nicer home in the nicer area for their first investment. Um, you know, you might go with the uh, the lower priced home as your first one, but I think it's good to have a mix of the two. Yeah, so most of our investors are in the position, Alistair, where they have somewhere in the neighbourhood of five hundred plus, um, five hundred thousand plus of you know capital they're looking to deploy into these investments. So you know, couple that with some leverage, um, yeah. and they're looking to build a portfolio of twenty to thirty homes. Um, so they're in a strong position. Um, you know, obviously the challenge for us in this market, as you know, is, is servicing that, that demand. Um, but to those investors that have significant uh, cash flow, that I mean, it's significant um, net worth and some deployable capital that they're looking to throw into real estate. Um, is there anything else that you would say? I mean, you know, I know you're bullish on real estate as a, but as a global investor looking at different ways to monetize, um, you know, rather than sticking dry powder in the bank, is there anything you would add to um, the real estate story I, I, in America? I don't see it as a. I, I'm not a big fan of the of the flip. I know you can make money that way, but then okay, so you've you've cashed out and you've made your profit. Then what do you do with your back money? You pay and taxes now in that on scenario, it. <laughs> now it's sitting back in the bank again, earning nothing. So you can say, oh, I'm great. Well, what a hero I am! I've made all this money on this property flip. But then. And no one ever hears, well, you know, what, what about the next nine months where the money was just sitting idle in the bank account or when you then had to deploy it uh, into some other investment? So I, I'm a good, and, what you know, maybe it sounds uh, lazy, but I don't think it's like that. I think it's shrewd. I'm all for the longer term, and I think I'd leave it there for the long term. In, in any of these investments, and that's one thing with all these, uh, the properties that we bought in KC, uh, you know, I look at how some of the prices have gone on some of the lower, lower priced homes and the higher priced, there's all been an adjustment. So, you know, when we were selling out, some of them had shown good capital return, others not so good capital return. They all yielded well during that time anyway. But now five years, four or five years later, you know, all of them are showing good capital returns. So, uh, you know, the timing, you know, if we, if we weren't as impatient trying to get out all at the same time, all in, uh, you know, the one year, 2016, 17, uh, you know, over time, all of the values, you know, end up uh, growing and growing quite strongly. So two big uh, takeaways. Oh, go, in the sorry, go ahead. So, yeah, I'm just of the view, I don't see the value in, unless you need the money uh, for, um, you know, for life circumstances, I'd be all for, you know, long-term investing in real estate. And all of these properties, regardless, as if they're yielding all the time and you've got good tenants uh, that are well-managed, uh, you know, if you're getting a reasonable yield, all of these assets are growing in value. Uh, and it's it's a very strong uh, investment compared to a number of others, and really quite a low risk investment. And Absolutely. making money every day, uh, you know, uh, forever. I, I don't see that as a as a bad thing. You know, some people say making a fortune in you know six months is is more sexy. But then, as I say, over the long term, uh, you know, you can't you can't make a flipping profit all the time. And sometimes you're going to start making losses. I think that that long-term buy and hold uh, is a more solid uh, play. And in in hindsight, if I you know if I had some of these investments in my own name, uh, you know I would have uh, sat on them uh, for much longer and still held them. No, two big takeaways there. One is that when you engage in group um, investments, um, I want to make this point very clear because we do often get even not so much from funds approaching us so much as, you know, two buddies, right? They'll come together and they'll say, hey, I'd really be interested in, uh, you know, we are going to be investing here. So you had a group of many, many individuals and it made it challenging to exit. But even with two people, um, you know, there's so many, the timing of the exit, the timing of the 
um, disposition of those assets down the road can get extremely cumbersome. And so I always encourage our investors to, you know, the only partnership should be a married couple investing, you know, um, outside of that, um, you know, the, the timing that you've addressed here of, of trying to get all the team on board, give them a good return, um, trying to exit without it being, um, uh, you know, too much of a tie up with one person's agenda over another that you have to consider. A um, lot of hurdles you have to overcome with, uh, you know, the group investing. Secondly, the timing of the market, you guys had to exit due to the being a group and you'd made a commitment. But, you know, we're looking back now with the five years in the rear view mirror saying, man, those assets would have gone up significantly in value that would have really um, helped on the return side as well. And so I, I appreciate from a global investor's perspective that, you know, this pass passive approach to investing as opposed to an active buy and flip model you know, is about as safe as they get. And not then you don't have to time the market. You don't have to, um, you know, try and hit some kind of up cycle or down cycle. And it's just purely, you know, buy a cash flowing asset in a good part of town, have a property manager take care of it. And you can sit back and have, you know, some uh, a passive investment, you know, the mailbox money that people are looking for. Yeah. And if there's a downturn in the market, uh, there's, there's no reason to be overly concerned by that because on the on the price of your original investment, you're still making a good yield. And as long as that investment is still uh, providing you the return and there's cash coming out through the, uh, through the tenant, uh, does it matter if the capital value has dropped off 10% or 20%? That's only if you're looking to sell. If you're not looking to sell, in you know three or four years' time, the price has recovered and, and over where you're at anyway. So uh, you don't need to be overly concerned by uh, the fluctuations in uh, prices of your underlying asset as long as it keeps returning. And on your original buy-in price, the the uh, you know the return still can mensure it with what you're getting at the beginning. It's it's still a strong asset, and over time, uh, it's it's always going to be worth more. And that's the beauty of the long term and sometimes doing it on your own uh, is that yeah, you're not uh, compelled to sort of uh, sell at a certain point and then, you know, crystallize profits uh, or losses. Yeah, I think in, even in the words of the downturn in 2008, nine, because obviously, as you know, we've been investing since 2001. The key, thing, the key thing to remember is if you don't sell in 2008, nine, you didn't get burned because the tenants don't get to renegotiate their leases just because the market went down, you know, so it's no. still cash flowing the same. And based to your point, based on the original investment, it's still cash flow positive. Yeah. So you should really only be looking at the price that you paid for on, on day one, not whatever the market value for it is at today. Wise words. I, I'd like to highlight for those that are only uh, listening to the podcast and not watching Alistair's hair color, I would say, is somewhere hovering between gray and white. <laughs> the it used to be gray. No it's mostly white now. I, I, <laughs> I'm, I'm not that old, but I've... Um, I'm Mate, the wisdom that, that comes from someone that had the experience, you know, you've just seen so many different models. Um, I probably should have started with this, but, you know, as a CFO, uh, a fractional CFO, effectively consulting different industry, you get to see many different companies Briefly for the audience, explain a little bit about how that has given you perspective. Are, are businesses inherently all the same or are they in very, very different when you look at different sectors of the economy? How do you approach uh, you know, it from, from the perspective of a CFO? Uh, look, I, I, my initial uh, experience was with uh, energy retail or actually a, uh, was more at the, when the industry was fragmented. So the, the distributor was separated from the retailer in, in energy markets, so for gas and electricity networks. So I spent a lot of time there in the back end working for the, uh, the network operator, which is a, you know, a solid you know, uh, Rolls Royce machine humming away in the background. Um, with, uh, you know, charging the retailers for their customers' use of the network. Uh, and then after that, my time in the uh, energy industry, I, I ended up in uh, a CFO for a listed property trust, the Rabinoff Property Trust in Melbourne. 
And that was, a, you know, a, I suppose a different type of business, but, but very similar in that, that's, that uh, uh, deep, slow humming machine uh, that's whirring away in the background, providing good returns for people. Since that, and, you know, so I've helped structure a number of other uh, property trusts. We've done smaller plays, uh, larger plays. We've had this, uh, you know, US residential. We've had other commercial industrial in Australia on a smaller and larger scale uh, through publicly listed and, and private institutions. Um, and then of late, uh, a more uh, sort of uh, troubleshooter, part-time CFO for startup companies. Uh, which is a very different sort of profile, um, you know, in biotech, uh, medtech, pre and post uh, IPO or the, um, you know, market listing point. Uh, and that's a very different uh, investor profile and, and business profile. But a lot of the, f the fundamentals still become the same. You know, it's, uh, I see a lot of uh, people chasing uh, ridiculous profits too soon and then having to, when they miss targets, then having to sort of double down on, on promises and, uh, you know, shoot even higher for the stars and, you know, end up coming up short, uh, are more for setting realistic expectations, delivering on those and then getting your investor support. And I think that's a lot of the trap that some of these startup companies fall into unless they're in a strong revenue position already, is that they make uh, unrealistic promises. Uh, and then, you know, there's a lot of risks and uncertainties attached to it. And, and if they don't mat match, meet those promises, which, you know, there's, there's no doubt good reasons why, why that can happen, uh, then everyone's under pressure and they almost then have to uh, promise even more uh, to keep people on board or get new investors. So I'm all for... Um, uh, one that 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 solid, you know, reliable engine, uh, that type of investing. But but alternatively, if it's more of a uh, speculative startup play, to set expectations low and deliver on those, and then bring people along for the journey. Otherwise, you otherwise you're making a rod for your own back by um, uh, over promising and under delivering. And that well, I was about to uh, end with um, a mis you know. This, this podcast, as you know, is uh, very much tongue in cheek called mistake free real estate, knowing that there's no such thing, really, you know, we have made all the mistakes in real estate, and we guide people through the, the hurdles and obstacles and challenges relatively risk free based on our um, 1500 flips that we've done in the Kansas City marketplace, rather than trying to do their first. Um, I don't want to steal your thunder. That was certainly one of those mistakes um, that certainly you see making. But is there um, if, is, if that was where you were going, happy to end there. But Alistair, I'll give you a chance for the last word. Is there a mistake that you have made in business um, or personally that, that has molded the way that you run and operate? I think in, in action, there's, a, there's just with that brief profile, I think in, in each of those scenarios, I've, I've missed opportunities. Um, In the energy days, you know, we could have set up a retailer at the time and we balked at that uh, because we thought we weren't quite ready for it. Uh, and a number of others ended up doing that. That would have been, uh, that was a lost opportunity. Um, I think the, this, uh, the US property trust that we did was great because we capitalised on that concept and actually went and did it and had the, um, the gumption to go and do so. My probably re only regret there is that we uh, and look, you know, it was all a success as we promised to do. It's in hindsight, probably still uh, be a good idea to have kept those homes. Um, and uh, I think uh, working with people that you weren't sure of—that's probably my, my, my biggest uh, business mistake is invariably if they're good people and you feel comfortable with them, everything works out all right in the end. And if, and if there's problems in the business, they can all be resolved by working together with people that you trust. It's, it's when I've got uh, in business with people that I felt uncomfortable with, that, that I felt I could manage that uh, 
that risk, that always ends up quite difficult and has, hasn't always ended up well. So whenever I've worked with good people, regardless of the, uh, you know, the pitfalls that you encounter along the way and the, and the problems uh, that you experience, normally they can all be resolved and you get through them and come out the other side uh, if you've got someone that you've got a good relationship with. When, when, when that's not there, and there's, there becomes a divergence in uh, views and sort of morals and ethics, that's when things get very difficult. So I suppose in, in summary to that, I'd say always work with good people that you feel comfortable with and uh, take advantage of opportunities. Uh, don't sit around thinking about them forever. If you, if you like the idea, act upon it. Um, because then, you know, the, the job's done and you never, re you know, nine times out of ten, you won't regret having acted upon your, uh, uh, you know, your ideas and, and initiatives. And you can always you can always get out of everything, but it's always mm -hmm. much harder to get involved in something three years down the track after you've been, you know, telling yourself, I should do that, I should do that. So I'd say uh, if, if, you, if you believe in it and you've found some good people, act upon it. And the mistakes that I've made is when I haven't done those. Love that. That's a great way to end the show. Um, thanks so much for your time, Alistair. It's been valuable. Really enjoyed this catch up. And I know that there'll be uh, a lot of interest um, from those that were listening in. So thank you. No, my pleasure, Mark. Very good to speak to you and, uh, and good to see you as well. And uh, uh, go Rawls and uh, shame about the Chiefs this year, but um, uh, well, let's not go there. Yeah, they'll go. They'll go. They've got a chance to go do it again next year, right? Yeah. Thanks, That's mate. Right. Okay. All right. Thanks very much, Mark. Oh, good talking. You're listening to Mistake Free Real Estate Radio, the authority in passive real estate investing. No late night calls. No clogged drains. No tenant nightmares. Take the passive investor's approach to real estate investing and trust a turnkey professional. Learn more at mistakefreerealestate.com. Until next time, remember, you don't get rich from what you earn, you get rich from what you own.